Hey everybody, it's Susan Linder. I'm your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. And today we are gonna be talking, we have, a, we have a double header on the show today. And I'm really excited because we're gonna see what it's like to actually bring innovation challenges to light and really begin to solve them when we're working in concert with outside eyes and outside hands that can help us get the job done and maybe even see around corners in ways that we hadn't before to discover new opportunities and new ways of thinking about an innovation challenge that perhaps we hadn't taken the opportunity to before. So joining me today is Carrie Chambliss, and she was the VP of Innovation at Jacobs, where she managed Beyond If, which is Jacobs Global Innovation Program, designing the next ways, wave of growth opportunities for the company. And while she was there, she championed design thinking, lean experimentation, and agile methodologies that we all know and love all across the business. Prior to that, she was the Senior Director of Innovation and Strategy at Thomson Reuters, where she led the deployment of the innovation program, including development of methods, processes, tools, and metrics to be used all across the business to foster that next generation of ideas, experimentation, and ultimately organic growth. With her is that this is we're really having like a jam packed women's day today, which I'm excited for Women's History Month as well. Is Valerie Vanden Kivas, and she is the managing partner at Cosmos Collective here in North America. Now, the agency was founded on the belief that experimentation lies at the heart of every company's ability to innovate and grow. And who would disagree with that? They are the masters of the process, and they apply powerful approaches to new business idea validation, growth, and transformation efforts. From her, She started off her career, or her last perch prior to getting into Cosmos was at Belcham, which is the Belgian-American Chamber of Commerce, for those of you not in the know, and where Valerie and I met, where she helped more than 250 European startups with their U.S. market entry strategies. And prior to that was working in corporate communications at a little mom and pop shop called General Electric. So Valerie, Carrie, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you, Sue, being here. So this is fantastic because having two women working innovation, wonderful, really being able to see around corners, target new opportunities and see things together and go out and tackle those challenges and go after those opportunities, something all of us want every day. So Carrie, I'd like to start with you at Jacobs. Tell us a little bit about A, how you got there, and then B, what was the opportunity that you were looking for when you tapped Valerie and her team? Sure. So I joined Jacobs about two years into their big Beyond If program. And partially my remit was to come in and help expand their presence and set up their capabilities in North America. Uh -huh. So they would had a lot of success with innovation and digital methodologies in Europe. And we were looking to figure out how can we replicate those? Are the markets kind of similar? How do we think about creating an innovation competency that's not just regionally based, but globally based? Mm. And for that, and then a lot of what we were trying to do was to really source ideas across the company. You know, I think- so from the employees or where were they coming right. from? Yeah. yeah. So I think we talk a lot about kind of innovation culture when we, when we talk about how do you as a corporation try to innovate if you haven't really been innovating. And one of the first things that, that lots of people do is, well, let's tap our employees. And so um, it's- for a couple of reasons. One is that we're hoping that they're closest to the customers and that they really identify the customer pain points that they can bring to leadership. And also because we want to put the power of so many minds together, this whole idea of crowd doing innovation. So one of our first tasks was to really try to unearth where are new opportunities and, and new problems to solve for Jacobs. And so we had kind of a an ongoing kind of laundry list of, of ideas that were coming forward. And one of them that was presented was an opportunity within the traffic signal industry space. And so one of the things that was really unique about the Beyond If program is it was fairly lean. And, and I don't think that's going to be too different for most corporate innovation programs. It's just like we teach, start little, 
find the opportunity, then expand as you get more interest and stuff like that. So we were a relatively lean team with experts that knew how to build innovation, but we needed a lot more support to do it. So we would have kind of subject matter experts, we would have process experts, but we also needed the cross-functional team that are necessary to bring forward ideas. And that's really where the opportunity to partner with Cosmos came in. You mentioned that Cosmos really tries to to bridge the gap in experimentation. And that's one of the things that we were really hoping to do. Innovation, the idea for us was, we know it's gonna fail, that's okay, but we need to do it quickly. We need to learn quickly. We need to know what we don't know. And then we need to be able to find new opportunities. And so we, need, we needed that capability. That was one of the things that, that was important for us and, and how we kind of came together. Can I, just, can I just stop you there for a second? Because it's fascinating. I hear so many companies are using employees to help drive innovation, which it, it's my personal philosophy that we come to work with other humans in order to solve challenges that are bigger than those that we could solve on our own, right? That is the joy, I think, of actually finding purpose and intention in our work, that we get to do it with others and we get to solve really big things, which is exciting. Yeah. Especially when we're looking at an innovation opportunity, we can go, wow, we could really blow the doors off this. And where can we get ideas? The challenge, I think, when I hear about resource innovation is setting parameters that make employees feel like they know the kinds of ideas they're suggesting, they know the constraints around the opportunity. And if they actually wind up putting the mental energy into giving a suggestion, Will anyone even hear it? Will <laughs> anyone take my idea seriously? And what happens to the ideas that don't get selected? So did you confront some of those or did you embrace some of those, those challenges when you started yeah. about that? Because, because it wasn't really my first rodeo. <laughs> we made a lot of those same mistakes. And what you're talking about is really how do you design a front end part of an innovation program? And that, that is incredibly important. But also the back end is even more important because I think people start out, and especially we executives really felt like, oh, are we going to get in the ideas? And I think they need to change that. They need to make the assumption that we are going to get ideas. What do we do once we get them? Not, does anybody have a good idea? Yeah, there's going to be lots of them. And so how do we go ahead and like you're saying, what's the filter process? What's the process for getting back to people? Are we going to actually take the idea and then some other team work on it? Are you going to have the person that brought it forward be the founder and move it through? These are a lot of really important questions to ask. Mm. I think when people set up innovation programs, they make some of these mistakes in not thinking about what, what does the process need to be? How committed are we going to be to these ideas? Are we just really doing a, a suggestion box kind of innovation program or not? And, and you mentioned it. There is tons of employee fatigue when it comes to kind of innovation. Like you'll be asked to submit a solution to this problem and a solution to this problem and a solution to this problem. And then nobody will ever talk about what happens with it. And right. so I think respecting that that your point about employees come to work and feel empowered to solve problems and feel passionate about it. That's what they do. You paid them to do it. So for us to call that innovation is kind of weird. I mean, it's kind of what, what I do as an employee at this company. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important to kind of walk a fine line between saying, we want you to do more of what you're doing versus we want you to do this innovation thing. And is the innovation really different and how is it? Different? Yeah. And what you do as a core job. Right. And that setting up that structure is so important because I've heard it from so many guests on this show. There is no greater morale killer than to solicit ideas from employees, to have them in good faith, give them, and then to watch the executive team do absolutely nothing with them. So tell us how it worked for you. What was the project? What did you ask of the employees and what did they come up with? Well, so the interesting part was that they came to us, which was nice. So it wasn't a great big game that we went out. We had built some partnerships around the company with folks that were innovative experts and that were close to kind of customers. And so 
they had come up with an idea via a client interaction and, and a light bulb had gone off to them and said, hmm, if this one client needs this, maybe there's a bigger opportunity here that we need to think about from an innovation perspective. And so they came to our team to say, we've got this opportunity. It's around advanced signal traffic processing capabilities and advanced. So this, is, this is street traffic, right? That's what we're this talking is, about. This, here. Yeah, it's, it's traffic signals. And how do we think about automating this and advancing this? And there's a lot of innovation that's kind of happening right now, especially with some of the Biden administrative administration and their financing new infrastructure. And so there's an opportunity to come forward and, and to really look at how we would modernize our traffic signals in the US. Mm -hmm. So the, the team, which was really just a couple folks that were sales and then engineering experts came and said, so we got this idea. We think there's something here. We just don't really know if it's more than just one client kind of opportunity. And so our process really was, okay, well, let's do some, some basic research. Let's, let's put our own kind of internal pitch deck together. What mm. is it? What's the, what's the opportunity? What's the problem we're solving? How, how many folks do we think have this problem? What do we think may be some initial solutions? With the goal of really saying, look, we, with any innovation, you don't know what you don't know. And what we need to be able to do is enter a period of discovery. So let's discover whether or not there's an opportunity here to keep going. Let's discover whether it's worth us building something out that's more formal. And we made that pitch to get kind of seed money, essentially, uh -huh. to be able to explore the opportunity. And the seed money really was money then to bring Cosmos in and help us jointly work together on assessing the opportunity. Yeah. And so how did that work then with Cosmos? What was, what was Cosmos role in this process, Valerie? Yeah, sure. So like in, like in many projects, we, we really look at what is the need of the company and depending on where the innovation team is in terms of their capabilities, we, we kind of adjust, right? But obviously we worked with a very experienced innovation team. So they have a lot of knowledge and insights and, and processes already in place, but our job was really to, to help put a, a quick and dirty, if you will, experiment plan together. So we, we, I think, Carrie, we worked together for about 14 weeks on a very intense basis where we start with the kickoff workshop. We go through what are our assumptions. And once we've established those assumptions, and these included, for example, we believe that traffic optimization is a priority for these engineers. And we had six of those. And around those assumptions, we created the experiment plan. And then during that experiment plan, we go into asset creation and from, from the moment we have these as assets, we actually go do the experiments. And that's often where we help these teams is the actual doing the roll up your sleeves, get your feet in the mud type of experimentation. So we create the assets, we create the experiments, and then based on those learnings, we have... Um, we adjust and we iterate. So usually those sprints are two weeks. And then based on those two week sprints, we, we gather all the learnings. And then at the end of our time together, we look at those results and make a decision. And in this instance, we actually invalidated this idea. And you know, invalidation is in many ways as important, if not more important than validating an idea. Right, Carrie? Yeah, it absolutely is. Like you said, uh, the fact that we could go from we don't really know if this is an opportunity to, we, we need to look at our next opportunity in 14 weeks is really an expedited process. And Fantastic. About it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've been in, in enough corporations that you may spend 14 weeks just trying to get, it takes a long time to kind of get people comfortable with moving at the pace that, that you need to in order to learn and evolve. And so this was, in, in our minds, this was, what money well spent and time that we would never have been able to produce uh, and results on our own, you know, that, that quickly. So uh, one of the things that, that Valerie kind of mentioned, the Cosmos team was expert in helping to, to pull out of a lot of the subject matter experts' minds. W what is it that we really need to know? When you think about some of the innovations that happen, 
these are not necessarily folks that are, again, schooled in an innovation methodology. They know a subject matter really, really well. And so you need that person to say, well, why is this important? Mm -hmm. And what do you think about this to get to the essence of whether or not this can succeed or not succeed. And they were really good at, at probing and getting those high level hypotheses that we needed to be able to, to vet. And, and I think the other thing that I would really highlight is that experimentation has, has evolved to the point of, it's not your, your father's market research, this is doing this in a live setting so that we know the reality of people's behaviors, not just things that, that they have an opinion about. Mm -hmm. Being able to have those authentic, real world experiments running to tell us whether or not there's really a market opportunity. Again, that's another invaluable part of doing this type of, of experimentation work. And can I, can I maybe add one more thing, Susan? So it's that tail old mistake of falling in love with your own baby. And that's what we still see with a lot of corporations when we work with them. And that is the advantage of hiring an external partner, because we can we can poke through some of these assumptions that they've really adopted, but have never tested, have never validated. And we can be that little extra voice. And, and we, we not only talk to them about it, but in fact, we bring the evidence that, that says something differently or that says the same, but at least we now have confirmed it. And now we can move on and decide if the baby is worth caring for, or if the baby really should, should find the new mom and daddy because this <laughs> This is not the place for this baby. And I think that is that is really important, figuring out how, how much do they love their baby? How much are they in love with this idea? And is this idea really one that, that should see the light of day, yes or no? And I think that's, that's why we can be very helpful. And again, do it all with a human-centric and evidence-backed point of view, of course. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the stories that wound up coming out of this this bit of discovery that you were doing, because this is some interesting experimentation. And in the end, it was like, yeah, no, thank you. We're not going to wind up pursuing this. Boy, are we glad we found out in 14 weeks as opposed to three years, right? And a half a million dollars later. That's right. I mean, I yeah. think one of the, the, the most valuable parts about this, like we said, the, the quick learning. So one of the things that was really, that really interesting, when we talk about innovation, there's so much that's happening in the digital space right now. And sometimes a lot of what we're trying to do is we're, we'll apply digital experimentation when you know maybe the industry isn't kind of ready or, the, or it's not the right channel for it. So one of the things that we did really learn was although the space is modernizing today, that it's still not ready for the kind of the digital marketing channel type of work that would be necessary to launch a product into that space. Timing is everything. <laughs> Yeah. And so that so was, does that, that mean you like put it on the back burner for six months from now, a year, two years from now? I've heard from uh, one of the beautiful things of having this show is being able to talk to innovators who work at 170 year old companies who say, we keep an innovation archive and every, every idea failure is stored in the vault. And we occasionally go back in when we have problems we need to solve and see if somebody else tried to solve this before. And then we go back out and fix it. So Corning Glass found a 1930s formula for glass that could stay cold for long periods of time. No, no one had any need for that back in 1933, but they certainly did during COVID. And that glass recipe from 1933 was what was used to make the Moderna vials during this pandemic. Wow. So when you think about even shelving an idea, it's like it's before it's time, or it's not necessary, or doesn't fit our business model right now, is there a way of kind of holding on to the idea and maybe keeping it for a later date? I think that they definitely get, we, we talked about this kind of being innovation leftovers, like some of them get yes. up Perfect. a little bit too frequently. You're putting them in the microwave and nuking them a little too often. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that's really valuable. And it's hard to do, but that knowledge transfer and what did we learn is part of wrapping up these projects. Because again, with some of them, it's a small group that we need to share this with the broader organization. So we, we have certainly a traffic business, but maybe there's some other 
parts of our business that could benefit from the learnings that we extracted in these projects. And that, that knowledge management kind of platform and dissemination of that learning is really, that, that, that's the goal. That's the value really of any innovation program is, is how quickly are we learning and about new spaces that are gonna provide value for us. Okay, so, so now, now let's hear the bad news and the story that you had to tell to the employees who came up with a brilliant idea and now recognize that, oh, this, this isn't gonna happen. What did that, what was the storytelling like in that scenario? Well, the nice part about it is that because they were working members of the team, they came to the learnings and they came to the conclusions along with the team. It wasn't something that at the end, you popped it up on them and said, oh, by the way, your idea, terrible. They started to hear from all of the, the potential clients and customers and needs along the way. As you're doing a lot of the user testing, it, it, it was like having them part of that so that they could say, oh, wow, okay, we didn't think about that. And, oh, well, that makes sense there. And so they were the, really the one. I mean, when you ask, like, how did we decide not to pursue it? They were the ones that came forward with the recommendation that we didn't pursue it because we wanted the, those folks to own the idea, to own the project. There, there wasn't going to be another team that was going to take it later on and run with it. These were the folks that were going to take it. And so they needed to be comfortable with where things were left. Now, with that being said, there, there was a lot of, of communication that went around to kind of talk to other groups and say, well, is there an opportunity to kind of pivot here with some of the learning and pivot there with some of the learning? And, and it's not easy, I think, to just say, we've heard this, now we're done completely. There's always that, well, what if we're not really ready to, to close the door on this completely? And so there were, there were some strings that were attached of saying, well, let's talk, let's talk to a few other groups here share our learning with them and see if they see any other way forward for us. Uh -huh. And then that was kind of the end of, of the, the project. Like when we got to a number of, of the other participants and said, do you see any other opportunity here? And they said, well, not from my experience in the space. So that was kind of the collection, the collective come together to provide that guidance of the timing wasn't right and the opportunity wasn't. Yeah, I love hearing this because number one, you kept all the stakeholders who created the, who came with the idea first, right, involved throughout the process, which I think is so critical from a communication standpoint. And Valerie, I know you're a phenomenal storyteller thinking about how we incorporate that. But the other is you get to the end of the process. What I hear from so many guests is if there is not an internal advocate, someone who is willing to die on the hill for this new project that it will not have like the vim and the vigor, both the human advocate and the data to back it up, it won't move forward. And so that is a story that says, no one can champion this. Therefore, it's not a champion among ideas. And it has to be, it has to be an idea champion first in order for someone to champion it. It has to be like a gold medal idea. Mm -hmm. And that, that passion and where that person is located within the company, that matters. That's true. Right. The, the innovation, head of innovation cannot be the one that's championing the idea. That's the unfortunate part. Oh, I love that. Carrie, say that again. Say that we one can, more time so we, we can, can all hear it. <laughs> yeah, we can champion the process, but the head of innovation cannot champion the idea. Love yeah. that. That's not... That's not the, our roles. And what, we, what I've experienced is when you don't have a, a business leader that's championing it or somewhere that you're connected to, to customers and to sales championing it, it really will not have a very long run. Well, and, and by the way, Susan, that's also why a lot of these teams and these budgets are currently put on, at a minimum, on pause, right? You see it a lot in these different organizations where you know, the, the champion, the business champion is having different priorities, different focus, the macroeconomics, and then, and then some of these things translate into the innovation teams losing some steam or some, even if it is great, they're not getting to a point where they can execute and, and pursue it further. And that's really unfortunate, but I think that's what I'm seeing in the market right now a lot of times. 
unfortunately. I find this a lot. I hear this story a lot in large companies working with startups. Everybody is has so desirous of working with a cool, hot startup, but there's no one on the corporate side who's actually championing the challenge that the startup is solving for them, right? So someone has to own the big, hairy, ugly problem and says, I pick you startup because we've done all of our due diligence to come in and fix it. And I will champion this startup through all the complexities, even though it's not localized into 400 languages, even though it doesn't have all of the security clearances necessary, let's say if we're involving like a new piece of software to solve a challenge, right? I'm going to be the one who's kind of with my machete going through the forest, throwing through the corporate jungle to get you the approvals and the access and the insights and everything else. If we're not really clear about the problem and the person who's championing it, then it's even that scenario with the best technology in the world isn't going to work. So Susan, it reminds me of sometimes clients ask us like, do you do venture building? Do you do this? Do you do that? And we're like, well, we don't know. It depends on your problem. And if venture building is the right solution to that problem. So yes, we have all these methodologies, all these processes, all these ways that we can potentially execute on a solution that is responding to your problem, but we need to take a step back and go back to that problem. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Who owns the problem? Who's in love with that problem? And then let's go from there and then figure out if it's a problem worth solving, et cetera, et cetera. But that is always the starting point. So it's always good to slow down and take a step back and make sure we've got that part covered. Yes. Well, this is fantastic. So I guess what this means, Carrie, is that I'm going to hear we're going to be sitting in traffic for a good long period of time yet. <laughs> well, I think what it means is that it, it, it is as modern as we need it to be. <laughs> so so enjoy the, the time and don't for time you know, for podcast. podcast while you're you're in traffic. Yeah, good news for everyone. <laughs> okay. Well, Carrie, I'm going to turn this, I'm going to put you both on the hot seat and I'll alternately ask you my three hot seat questions for you. So my first question is, and I'll pass this over to you, Carrie, what do you think is the greatest innovation in human history? If you had to choose one, what would it be? Oh my goodness. What a difficult question to ask. <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the invention of electricity, I mean, that, that certainly has revolutionized ev everything about the way that we live. Yes. As nice as we all look by candlelight, electricity yes. really has made our lives yes. just a touch better. Yeah. Just okay, touch Valerie, better. if you had the chance to join any innovation team in history, because we're destroying the notion that innovation gets done by one brave genius, um, what innovation team would you have liked to have joined? I mean, it's so silly or typical maybe, but any team that has ever put somebody into space, I think is just <laughs> like literally rock stars. So being amongst the rock stars to get people to the stars, that's, that's the team I would love to be, have been part of, or will want to be part of. Fantastic. Did you hear that? Mr. Musk, Mr. Bezos, Mr. Branson, <laughs> we have a new volunteer for your team. <laughs> and I'll Carrie, I'll follow up with you. Our last hot seat question, or you can both take a swing at this if you want to. What is something that really pisses you off or someone, something that you think would bring absolute joy to humanity if it were invented? So something that would eliminate your pain or something that would make you incredibly happy, what would that be? That's funny. I, sh you know, I should actually write these things down when they come to mind because of questions just like this, because you know, in everyday world, you're walking by and why hasn't somebody figured out how to do this? Totally. <laughs> I've got to think, because I had one just this week over that. And I, I have to, I'll have to pass that. Valerie, do you have one that's on the top of your mind? This is a little bit of a cop out, but what pisses me off is the lack of ownership and accountability which ultimately leads to empowerment. So I think instead of looking for answers externally, get a product, service, whatever great invention there is or not as yet, is this, this, this notion of finding an answer inside of you and taking full ownership of, of your decisions, your actions, your thoughts. I think that could completely change the world and, and create a, a better world for all of us. So our our in our invention in this case is a shift in mindset definitely 
where we take full ownership and responsibility for all the decisions that we make, good, bad, and ugly. Yep, it's, it's your AI wonderful. twin or something. It's yeah, like, exactly. I need an AI twin who always you go. Her, her fault so <laughs> that she can fix things and, and feel empowered to be part of the solution and not just a problem. And I think that is a very powerful idea that I feel really strongly about and that I also want to project into the world and to my kids, by the way. Hmm. Fantastic. Well, Carrie, I don't know if you have one, but if not, well, certainly we can add it to the show notes after, but what is the, what is the best way for folks to get in touch with both of you? The, the easiest way is through LinkedIn. You can easily find me there and just send me a message. I'm happy to, to connect on all things innovation and cool new entrepreneurial ideas and, and certainly on kind of the, the innovation management front. How do we think about bringing that forward? Fantastic. And Valerie, how about you? Yeah. Love LinkedIn. Love people just randomly connecting, giving me a reason to, to learn or giving me a reason to, to teach if appropriate. That's, that's my job. That's my what? That's my vibe. <laughs> that's what I want to say. <laughs> well, Valerie, Carrie, thank you so much for joining me on, especially during Women's History Month, to have two great innovators joining on this call. I'm, I'm absolutely over the moon to have spoken with both of you. Thanks so much. It was great.